Hi, it's Valerie Timms from Timms Real Estate Adelaide, South Australia, and I'm here with the gorgeous Sadna Smiles. Um, Sadna, welcome. How are you today? Thank you for having me, Valerie. I'm actually really well for a Monday. You know what it's like in real estate on a Monday? Everything that can possibly go wrong on a Monday goes wrong, but I'm good. I'm exactly. Good. Thank you so much for your, for your time on a Monday too. Um, I want to um, let our listener know a little bit about you um, because I'm sure we've all heard of Sardana Smiles, the famous, fabulous lady, but you have got such a list of amazing things that I'm actually going to read them out if you don't mind. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'll just go and hide while you do that. <laughs> so um, you're the global CEO, director of Harcourt's Move and founder of Lynx Fiji. We'll get into that in a sec. I'll ask you about that. So um, so um, Harcourt CEO. Um, That's for CEO for property management. Property management. And you've got Harcourt's Move, which is a property management business, business? too. Yes. Absolutely. And Lynx Fiji, which is a charity, right? That's correct. Yes. Awesome. Yes. But also Victorian Telstra businesswoman. Um, AFRWC 100 Women of Influencer winner, um, Institute Manager and Leadership Victoria winner, um, Aria, Most Influential Woman in Business. <laughs> wow. And it keeps going. Um, uh, senior Strategic Positions Across Top Brands, Creative the Ambition Report Study, which is what women in business need to succeed. Um, what else? Uh, Lynx Fiji. There's more. Uh, founder of the Harcourts Walk a Mile in Their Shoes, another great charity initiative. Um, advisory board member, White Ribbon Advocate, um, Australia Centre for Human Rights and Health Ambassador, and author of People and Power, which I actually have a copy oh, of. Oh, you actually have a copy of. <laughs> and it's signed by you. Signed by me as well. <laughs> so that was a while ago. <laughs> And I have read it. So <laughs> it was a while ago. I think that was a few years ago. So um, 13 or 14, I think that was. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. incredible. What a lineup of um, skills, experience, a wealth of knowledge. Um, Sadna, what drives you to do what you do? Oh my God, that's such a good question. Um, okay. So what drives me? I think probably the thing that drives me the most is that I don't have a ceiling in terms of what I see as success. So, um, I'm one of these people that goes, I wonder how far I can push this. And mm. so I tend to think more about what I can achieve rather than think about all the things that are going to go wrong, therefore I won't be able to achieve it. Uh -huh. um, having said that though, that's taken a long time for me to get there. I mean, I suffered from the imposter syndrome for a long time and the Telstra Award is a really good example of that. I didn't nominate myself for that award, somebody else did, because I just didn't think I was worthy of it at the time or I hadn't done enough at the time to be worthy of it. And that probably was the starting point for me around, you know, the you know, we talk about glass ceilings, but I think the biggest glass ceiling we put is the one we put on ourselves when we tell ourselves or our voice internally tells ourselves that we can't do something. So um, I kind of now have the mindset of, well, if somebody says no to me, I kind of feel the need to do it to prove them wrong. So <laughs> that. Um, and secondly, it's like, you know what, I think we can all do it whatever we want, but what holds us back is what we tell ourselves, you know. So if I really wanted to go and climb Everest, yeah, of course I could if I did the training and I had the skills and I had the right people to get me there and all the effort that it takes into it. Mm. But I choose not to do that, you know. So I, that, that's my mindset. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, let's talk about um, being the CEO um, of Harcourts. Um, what do you, what's your role entail? Like, what are some of the, what are some of the toughest things you have to do in your role? Oh, um, <laughs> deal with property managers. No, I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> That's my background as well. So I came into this role in uh, two, two and a bit years ago. So I used to be the CEO for Harcourts Victoria and I did that for seven and a half years. And then the, the reason why I moved into this role was that, you know, Property management has been the poor cousin of the real estate business sector Absolutely. for a very long time. And it's not until that we go through a crisis that business owners tend to look at their property management business to say, oh my God, 
you know, that needs to pay for our bills as such. And that has been the case for many, many years. But also at a franchising level, there aren't many franchise brands who equally pay attention to their property management business. You know, you're always second cab off the rank for training, conferences, um, any type of development, marketing, technology. And so it was a real good chance for me to step into this role and actually say, you know what, this is a really important part of our business. It's 50% of all of our business out there. Yeah. Um, we take care of people's investments, but there is so much, the, the ability to up, Sell from property management is bigger than the ability to upsell from a sales um, transaction. Yeah. And so probably for the last two years, I've worked really closely with my team around the country on, and, and in New Zealand on developing that um, value piece for business owners to actually start thinking about this part of the business very differently. Um, I think that's a challenge. I think that's so incredible because I've always felt the same way that property management has been that poor, you know, second cousin um, to the real estate sales, yet it is such an important part. Mm. And in fact, it was um, National Property Managers Day um, on Friday. Yeah. Recently. And, um, you know, uh, my new property manager received flowers and was taken out to lunch. And, you know, it was a bit of a hoo-ha. And she said, oh, I've been in real estate for years and I, I nobody's ever recognised it. I, I, didn't even, <laughs> she said, I didn't even know it was a thing. And so I think it's so important that, um, you know, we do apply more of what we do in sales to um, the rentals, property management side of the business, because it, it is such a pivotal part of our our, our income and our business and yeah, it's hard and work it's hard work it is hard work and I, I did a survey which I haven't released yet because COVID hit us and um, I actually we had about a thousand responses around the country and one of the things that really struck me was the amount of stress that property managers experience day to day and it's quite high mm. and then you know you add something like COVID on top of that which means that their stress levels have got even higher over the last few months. And my question to there are business owners um, or managers listening to this podcast today is that, you know, we, we need to actually acknowledge the work that the property managers yeah. do um, because your rent roll is your that part of the business that's going to get you the income when you go to sell it. So it's your retirement fund, it's your superannuation fund, it's the value of your business. Um, and if you have stressed out, unhappy people running the business, part of the business that you're going to sell to achieve the ability to retire or to make your money, then you've got to really stop and say, hey, that's not going to work because stressed out, unhappy people are never going to run a good business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is so true. Um, I'm a big believer in health and wellbeing. And, um, you know, in my company, we've got a health and wellbeing program that I've developed over the last couple of years. Um, so now what do you feel are some of the key, um, key aspects to the health and wellbeing of your team or your, the, the wider sort of global team that you're working with? Yeah, and, I, and, and this is where business owners really control this. So, so you, work, you work with, um, the property manager inherently doesn't like change and because they, they, they get used to using a particular product or they feel they don't have time to change or time to train. So we have to change that mindset of the property manager mm. and then we have legacy based systems that we use in property management so systems that are don't have are not driven by ai or not driven by um you know technology that gives property managers time and space and then there's the fear of change so as a business owner right now what we need to be doing is saying well how do I make my business more efficient? Mm. So how do I add that technology layer in my business that does the heavy lifting for my property managers yep. so that I can get them to do stuff that they enjoy? You know, yeah. no property manager wants to come into the office and find they have 150 lease renewals that they are overdue by or, you know, 30% of their rent roll needs inspections done. You know, I can't even imagine through COVID how far behind some of these businesses have got and yeah. so that's adding to the stress levels to the property managers whereas if you had the AI piece doing the heavy lifting then that all would be done automatically you see so I think it's and I, I've said this many times it's COVID has almost brought us 
forcibly to a new starting point. Mm. Uh, we've, had to add, we've had to add on layers of technology that we may not have considered before. So it's brought us to a new starting point. You know, you've got to be paperless. You've got to be on the cloud. You've got to have systems by high levels of AI in your business. And your property managers have got to be focusing on the relationship, not the day-to-day -day admin work. And if you still have the ability or capability of outsourcing tasks in your business, then you should be outsourcing mm. as well. And that really changes the dynamic that people work in. So they can start at a normal time and finish at a normal time. They yeah. don't take work home with them. And they don't have to work weekends. And that brings the stress level down. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that, that whole COVID piece around, you know, um, people have had to implement better technology during COVID. Um, I think it's important when we, we talk about um, staffing levels too, you know, um, I think gone are the days where you'd have, you know, one property manager um, sort of trying to do everything for, uh, you know, 150 properties. Um, you know, those, it's just not, not possible anymore to have the one person doing every single task across that um, rent roll and um, I think we're seeing that even in sales as well in so far as I've been doing this for 21 years Sardner. <laughs> so I started when I was 10 too yes. and so <laughs> and so um, you know really like there's just so much more to be done like these oh. days you've got to be social media expert you've got to be able to be a video superstar um, you know, you've got to be able to um, manage databases and client expectations, let alone, you know, list, sell, lease, negotiate, um, you know, uh, deal with legals, go to tribunal, all of those types of things. There is just so much that needs to be done. So, the other thing is, the other thing is that, um, and I know Macquarie Bank has been talking about this for a long time, and, and basically we know that as an industry, particularly in property management, our fees are coming under pressure. Yeah. And, and so over the next few years, we really are going to start to see, I mean, even now, owners are ringing us up saying, you know, I've reduced my bank fees, I've reduced my mortgage rate, I've reduced this, can I reduce the management fee? It just seems to be the next automatic thing to do. Yeah. Um, so we've got to actually reassess our businesses and come out of it with a business model that can sustain low fees mm. and right now for a lot of businesses running your traditional property management models the mm. low fees is just not sustainable yeah um and and no and there's no you know one right system it, it's it's whatever system works for you to provide you with the highest level of efficiency so if somebody says to you i want four percent management fees you know that you can offer that knowing that your profit margins still exist Incredible. Yeah, that's interesting. And what, what do you think are some of those key factors to do to be able to do that? You've got to have you've got to have the right technology in place that does all your heavy lifting for you that provides you then with the efficiencies that you need in your business. You need to restructure. I think gone are the days where property managers did the end to end management um, of a portfolio of properties. I think you know, um, we're moving towards a business unit type of strategy where people who are really good at that owner relationship look after the owners and people who are really good at that tenant relationship look yeah. after the tenants, you know. Yeah. Uh, but working in a pod, so you've got a team of people who work together. So if one goes off on sick leave or annual leave, you still have others who can step in. Yeah. Um, and also looking at ancillary income. So how else can we get income into the business other than management fee, letting fee and lease renewal fees, which are the three key income earners for us is to actually look at what else can we do? How else can we provide the service that we provide within our business to our clients? So, you know, is there moving, is there insurance, is there smoke, like all these other things that we do. Mm -hmm. And can we then provide those same service to our sales database and actually yeah. charge for it? You know, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's really turning this whole thing up, upside down, inside out onto its head kind of stuff and going, you know, let's yeah. start again, burn it down to the ground and let's start again. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. but rebuild it in a different way. Absolutely. And so, um, Sadna, are you happy to maybe share what you feel are some of the key technologies for someone running um, a rent roll at this point? Um, should funny you. Consider funny you. Funny you asked me that because I've I actually started doing this um, process today with my department manager where we went, you know, okay, so let's look at some of the efficiencies we've got under each of our components under our system. 
versus what a traditional business mm -hmm. would go through. And we looked at a traditional business where, you know, I'll, I'll go through, because I've got it right here in front of me, where, um, you know, a lease renewal process comes in and what happens is, you know, we've got to do a CMA, we've got to check, check with the owner, usually by email or phone call, and then we have to talk to the tenant and then we have to send emails out, then we have to do the lease, redo the lease, mm -hmm. um, and then we have, you know, so it's like, to, it's about 10 or 15 steps that a normal business would take or we've cut ours down to five or six steps right. because a lot of it is now being done by AI. We use a product in our business called Our Property. Okay. And what Our Property has done for us is it's created high levels of efficiency within the business. So it's literally either halved or reduced by more each of those key components of a property manager's job. Yep. Amazing. Um, so where all, where all the admin stuff is is done automatically and they action the human part of it right yeah and that and that technology is only going to get better and one of the things i say to property managers is pick the best product out there now that's going to provide you with the highest level efficiencies it may not be the product that looks pretty or does everything to a hundred percent or mm -hmm. operates in the stable environment where nothing goes wrong because we're long past that you know iPhones aren't stable and they've been around for years, so we still use them. Yeah. So this idea of something never breaking down, running my property management business actually isn't relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to move into an environment where we are agile and we take on products that are not 100%. We are always going to be the early adopters then. And yeah. I can guarantee you in two years' time, there will be another product on the market that does something better than the current one that we are using right now. And we need to be agile to shift that straight away. Agile, not fragile. That's what I always say yeah. about business, agile, yeah. not fragile. And um, I've seen Les Brown speak at Eric and he's got this fabulous saying, which is like, you know, jump off the cliff and you'll grow your wings on the way down. And that's kind yeah. of what you're talking about is like, you've yeah. still got to make that leap. You know, you can't wait till you've grown the wings. You've just got to go and you'll grow them as, as, yeah. as you're heading down. Um, so you can keep flying. Um, and that's incredible. But do, do you find sometimes that, um, like, people in the team maybe resist the change in technology? Are they worried it's going to, you know, as soon as you say AI, people think that's going to take my job away. Yeah. Well, how do you counteract that? Well, I think, and the way I did it in my business was I looked at the stress levels of the people in the business and um, wanted to create a different environment for them. So I, 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 for me, it was more around, we need to create a place where people come to and love to work here, yeah. you know. Like I've had a new girl start in my business a week ago and she was in here last week babysitting a portfolio for department manager who was away. And she sat here on the Friday night and she said to me, she said, this is an awesome place to work. I love it here. This is a week into a new job. Beautiful. And one of the reasons why she, she does that or said that was because we don't work under high stress environments. You know, everyone is calm in the business. Nobody runs around tearing their hair out because it's a Monday. Yeah. So that was what I wanted my people to have. And so that was always the first discussion. Yeah. Change the environment you work in. And so I took my department manager to Queensland. I showed her a business where it was working and how it was working. And she was very um, wary of the concept beforehand. You know, the, the level of belief wasn't there. And I think if I'd forced the change onto them without taking her somewhere where she could see it actually happening, yeah. um, it would have been a very different experience. But by the time she flew back to Melbourne on that day, she had the whole department reorganised in her head. Yeah, fantastic. She could see it, right? So I think if you are going to go down a change process, go to offices where this is working well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think what I've learned over the years in leadership is I've got quite an entrepreneurial mindset. So I love change and I like pounce on opportunities really quickly. Um, but when people don't have an entrepreneurial mindset and they're more of the, you know, um, sort of that steel energy of, of you know, focus and, and, you know, getting things in place and in order, um, it's really important not to push that change onto people too rapidly. Um, they need to be able to buy into that idea and get a really good background understanding that you're not, it's not taking their job away. It's actually making yeah. the job, it's improving it. It's reducing the stress levels. It's giving them their weekends back and, and hopefully yeah. nights back and, um, you know, giving them more time to do those 
human interactions that make the job worthwhile and taking yeah. away those interactions that like artificial intelligence can take care of. Yeah. And also making sure that the clients, um, you know, I'm a big believer in mapping out the client journey. So one of the things that I'm constantly doing in my business is I'm constantly mapping out the client journey. So, you know, we've just put another product on here uh, called Sorted and Sorted is all about the tenant ac acquisition piece. Now, Previously, it was taking us over an hour to process applications because people didn't put all the information in there. We were backwards and forwards on phone calls and stuff. And after a week of having it in place, we are processing applications really, really fast. Our clients are actually saying to us, this is a great way for you to get me to apply for a property better than anywhere else that we've experienced. And then with the other side of it with our owners, they have high levels of transparency. And so they say to us, this is great. I've got it on my phone and I can check up on where my property is at to, uh, up to, whereas before I used to have to bring my property manager up and then they would be there and then be backwards and forwards and take me two or three days to get through. So whatever you do, you've kind of got to put the client in the middle of that process and say, how do I make this easy for them? Because if I can make it easy for them, I'm going to make it easy for myself. Mm, mm, amazing. So, Sadna, you're in the midst of stage three lockdown, um, the second round of. Um, I guess this is, um, you know, for, for everyone across Australia and, and, and the world, I guess, is that, you know, we've got to be so mindful um, that this can happen at any point in time. Um, and you, you mentioned before that, you know, as businesses, we need to be ready to pivot at any point in time. How are you, um, first of all, how's everyone's mental state, <laughs> you know, um, but how are you managing this second round? And that's a really good question, Valerie, about the mental state. And I think um, that was probably the first thing that hit us. So mm -hmm. this is now we are week three on Wednesday of stage two lockdown, uh, stage three lockdown, mark two. Yeah. And I remember on the day that it was announced and it happened and, you know, I went, I think like you, you, as, as a business owner, you go into making sure that everybody else is all right first. And I remember driving home that afternoon and everybody around me, like my people I work with, my family, people, you know, my partner, we were just all, like we'd been sucker punched, you know, it was, yeah. it was, it was hard. But then what I did, I said to my guys and I said to myself, you know, we don't focus on an end date because the reality is unless we get this under control, we could have the end date extended. Yes. It was six weeks to start off with, but it could be extended. So number one, we know what to do. We've done it before. You know, we pivoted again to virtual inspections, one-on-one yes. uh, yes. -on -one private appointments for, um, sorry, virtual routine inspections, one-on-one -on -one private appointments for inspections, all the stuff that we've done. So, we, you know, we pivoted really, really fast. Yeah. Um, I made sure, you know, if people needed to take time off, go and have a week off or a few days off to yeah. to reset yourself yeah. and let's not focus on the end date let's focus on doing the business we need to do yeah. day by day by day because i think and i know with me if i focus on that end date whatever date that happens to be i don't know what it is mm. um, and if it doesn't happen it's another blow you know mm. um and like today the numbers came out um of state this 27th of July and and you know it's 532 yesterday 10 people day before 10 people died today six mm -hmm. people have died and so it's actually getting to the point now where you actually go out in public Valerie and I'm kind of like do yeah. I really have to go to the shops you know what no I don't it's that it's the fear factor that's starting to creep in now because yeah. we just don't know who's got it yes yes absolutely um, and how are you managing your teams? Um, how, what are you implementing to manage your team's day-to-day -day, um, well-being? Like in, in terms of, um, I know when, when it hit for us in South Australia and we were shut down, um, I was on daily Zoom meetings with my yeah. team. So we had the option of Zoom or being in the office when we were able to be in the office um, and, you know, managing that way. Like, um, how are you how are you pulling that together so the first time that happened 50 percent of my team worked from home and the other and the rest of us worked in the office and we did the same thing daily zoom meetings so first thing in the morning um and last thing in the afternoon and sometimes you know at least once a week we would have lunch together via zoom yeah. and go out 
drinks on a Friday night. So, you know, there was high levels of connectivity. The system um, that we have ran itself in terms of what was outstanding. I get a report at the end of every day. So I wasn't concerned about the day-to-day running of the business, more around the headspace of the people who worked in here. Mm. Interestingly enough, this time round, my team have said to me, we don't want to be at home. Mm. And I think part of that is because a lot of my team members live alone. Yep. And for them to be at home on their own for another six weeks, day and night was probably going to be an issue for them. Yeah. And so I respected that. And all we've done is we've got these um, fabulous <laughs> I love it. <laughs> You've been out and you shared fashioning those up, Sadna. <laughs> yep, yep. So we've got these. Like, you know, so we've got all, we're like, so I'll just spread everybody out in the office. I've got yep. two people in the boardroom. To, so we just spread out the office and yep. we have the masks on. We have the front door closed. We have to ring the bell to get into us. So we've limited our external exposure. Yep. But it's about keeping the team morale up. So it's yes. around, you know, what training can you do? Can we have... You know, we get lunch once a week, a touch base with them on weekends. And, you yeah. know, so it's doing whatever we can to keep the morale up. But I, what I found interesting was this time the team actually said we want to be in the office. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I really discovered during that process, you know, before COVID, everyone was sort of saying, oh, you don't really need big offices. You don't need, you know, space and et cetera. And, um, but then during COVID, I, I just, I really saw, um, you know, some of the team love to be at home, but it wore thin after a while, particularly if yeah. A, you're on your own, but also B, if you were trying to work with your children yeah. at home as well. And, and you know, it, it, it became complex. And so I've really discovered with my team that they actually want to be in um, a beautiful environment um, with the camaraderie of being together. And they want to also have the flexibility and the choice of if that's a training session, I want to come into that or I can't that day, but I can zoom in from home because my kids are sick and I I need to do it from home. So we've really flexed that right up so that, um, you know, we can have a a training masterclass on something and we might have, you know, a number of people in the room and then the rest of them are on Zoom. Mm. And I think that technology is incredible. I th- and I, th- I actually agree with you. I think it's not going to be one or the other. You know, mm-hmm. you're not going to all work in the office or all from home. I think mm-hmm. there's going to be, a, a, I hope, um, a nice, flexi, balanced world that we go into where yeah. I can choose to work from the office three days a week or two days a week or at home. Or I can choose to do nine-day fortnights. Or I can choose mm-hmm. to work, you know, Monday to Saturday but have the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday off. I think we're working and going into a world where we can work with our employees to say, what suits you? Yeah. You know, the traditional nine to five, Monday to Friday, I think genuinely think is gone. And I think as we come out of this, I want to be able to sit down with my team and say, all right, what suits you? If you yep. want to be in here on a Sunday and have the Monday off, don't have a problem with that. Yep. But how is it going to work? You know? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, my hope is that we have enough leaders in our industry who will actually embrace that and move forward in that in that way. And I'm sure, Sadna, with the way you inspire as a leader within the industry, that with you putting that information out there and those those vibes out there, that people are definitely going to be in alignment with that. So um, what, moving forward, um, what do you see are going to be some of the key changes and what do you, like, what do you really want to see change in our industry um, for the better from what we've all experienced in the last six months? I think that, I think there's, there's a couple of things. I think technology goes without saying. We've spoken enough about that, but definitely the, the technology piece. I think the workplace structure, I think how we work is going to change, um, as we've just spoken about. Yeah. I think that um, the type of person we employ in property management will change. If you change your technology, you change your systems, you change your work environment, you may, in the process, find you change the type of people you need working in this part of the industry as well. Yeah. So um, I think that will happen organically um, as the yeah. other two changes. I'm really hoping that property management post this pandemic be- it becomes an important part of the business. It becomes integrated into sales businesses and property managers genuinely have a career path into leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
I started off as a receptionist, Valerie, and you know where I am today is because I just kept pushing and asking and pushing and asking, right? But the reality is, I think we need to be able to sit down with people and see the potential in them and actually say, I see the potential in you to be a partner in this business or to have a shareholding or to yeah. have a profit share. And this is the career path. These are the behaviours we need to see from you. This is the performance we need to see from you. This is how this is going to work, you know. And, and I think we really, to, to keep good people in our business, we need to start looking at that. Um, and then I think the industry is going to change a little bit. My feeling is that there's going to be a lot of consolidation in businesses. You know, there might be smaller businesses who consolidate with other small businesses to make one big business yeah um i think your bigger businesses will have an opportunity to um buy up other smaller rent rolls or businesses in their marketplace and become bigger or create massive big hubs where they work and so you know it goes from an office with two thousand properties to eight thousand properties but it's a hub as mm. such. Um, I think, you know, uh, you look at franchising. I don't think franchising will be the same in two or three years' time. I think there are so many new models coming on the market at the moment that it will evolve into a hybrid type of model. And I think those of us in franchising need to keep an eye on what is happening and what people are wanting in this space. Um, and then, you know, I think we're going to go from being hyper-localised agents to being a more broader um, offering in a business. Because you think about it, the minute I start offering more than sales and leasing, so, mm -hmm. you know, and I start offering insurance and mortgage and maintenance, um, and I broaden, and people can work from home or from the office, yeah. there's nothing stopping me from having a portfolio of properties or a hub 20 kilometres away from the main centre of my business. Yep because I've got an awesome team member who lives out there. Yeah. Right? So suddenly it, it's like, I think in, in real estate and I think particularly in property management, we really need to sit down and like, just throw these things on a wall. Yeah. And not all of them are going to stick. Yeah. But I guarantee if in four years time, we rehab this conversation, Valerie, a lot of what probably I'm hearing and things that I'm working on are going to happen. Yeah. So in other words, we, we just need to be really open-minded. We need to be creative and yeah. we need to be working out what the consumer and um, that, that includes the public, but our, our consumer being our team, our property managers, um, you know, our, our sales team, um, what they're looking for and what they're needing so that we can yeah create an incredible environment that works. Um, because I know, I know recruiting, recruitment and retention in property management is a really tricky thing, you know? And what, what happens is a lot of property managers just burn out because they're doing ridiculous hours dealing with ridiculous stress levels and um, it just doesn't work. So I, I think what I've seen through this time is, is a refashioning of everything like re you know rethinking of how we do things and really getting to the guts of well what's going to work and what do people need and what do they want and what are we able to provide oh. so um it's it's whilst it's been really difficult for everyone i think there's some really exciting things that are coming out of um the adaptation we've had to rapidly make yeah, uh, it's got all of our creative thinking juices you know flowing <laughs> so yeah. 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 No, I totally agree. Right. Sadna, is there anything else you want to um, impart for our listeners on any, on any topic? What's no. on your mind? <laughs> well, I think for me on my mind now is, I, I, you know, I'm focused on getting through the next three or four weeks in Melbourne um, yeah. and, and then working out what the next part of this journey in this pandemic looks like. Yeah. Um, and then really getting business ready now for what we hope will be the wave of new business coming through once this yeah. pandemic is over. You know, I'm, I'm not doing the whole sitting down and waiting for it all to be fixed. Like I already have on my list of things I want to keep, things I want to yeah. not keep, you know, um, looking at my P&Ls on a regular basis. Well, if I've cut back on these costs now, then do I really need to add them back in? Um, assessing new models and new ways of doing business. And I think, you know, 
I would suggest to all business owners is to start getting creative now on what the opportunities are going to look like post the pandemic. Don't wait post the pandemic for that to happen um, because you need to be ready to go. It's almost like, you know, the thing's going to go, the bell's going to go, the gun's going to go off and we're just all going to go come out of our yeah. Um, boxes and just run and I think you need to be you need to have your team on site you know so if you haven't updated all your software and things do it now mm. become paperless now scan everything in people have got time to do that at the moment you know so mm-hmm. it's almost like getting your house ready now for what it potentially you may have the opportunities to do absolutely later on. Mm. great advice I think it is a it is a real time of opportunity and that is the absolute mindset that we need to have about this and and so many great opportunities opening up we've just got to be there ready for it and be making it happen yeah Sadna, thank you so much for your time today. Um, My you're pleasure. An amazing lady, um, a huge inspiration of mine, and I really appreciate that you've taken the time um, to spend with me and our wider audience to impart your amazing knowledge. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Sadna. Bye.